Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Tanim Ground, Papua New Guinea's Q&A series to encourage public debate, dialogue, and engagement on development challenges and opportunities facing our country and how we, as citizens, can help shape our nation's future. My name is Alan Bird, and I will be your host as we discuss a topic that is of vital importance to our future, one which ultimately affects the standard of service delivery, the quality of life for every citizen, the level of investment in our nation, and ultimately the perception about our country on the world stage. Welcome to Revenue Transparency, Perspectives from Government, Civil Society and Industry. We will be taking a number of pre-submitted questions from the audience and from those in other parts of the country. We will also be tweeting live from this room. Would you now please join me in welcoming to our panel Mr. Dairi Vele, who is the Secretary for the Department of Treasury. So thank you, Dairi, for joining us. Uh, to my left, we have Ms. Betty Palasso, who is the Commissioner General for Internal Revenue. Also to my left, I have Mr. Peter Eitzi, Country Manager for PNG Newcrest. Thank you, Peter. To my right, I have Ms. Mayambo Papal, who represents the Business Against Corruption Alliance. Mr. Paul Barker, who represents the Institute of National Affairs. It's always good to have you on our show, Paul. Thank you for coming. We have Mr. Richard Kassman, who is the representative of the PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum. Thank you, Richard, for joining us. And of course, a crowd favorite, Mr. Martin Namorong, who is an internationally recognized writer and blogger. <laughs> PNG is endowed with extraordinary wealth, with a projected growth in GDP next year of 21% when world growth is expected to be, on average, around 3%. PNG growth is being fueled by the emerging LNG sector and will result in huge new revenue streams for the government. This will present many challenges. How will you manage them? Secretary. If we take one step back, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, discussion uh, in, as, in terms of policy and, and, and also in, uh, in the intelligentsia and, and in the public as to, as to how we're going to deal with, uh, you know, hopefully the, 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 you know, the positive revenues that can come from something like a, you know, a petroleum project. But I think we've we got to remember, we've seen this before. You know, if we achieve our target of six, uh, you know, low 6% growth this year, that's 14 years of, of, of continual growth. And I like to say 11 years of, you know, on average between 6 to 9% real growth. You know, we've had Kutubu and we've had mines before with, with, uh, with Bougainville and Octedi operating. We've had Kutubu, Goben, Moran over the last, you know, since the early 1990s. And, and, and I guess, you know, some of the lessons from, that we've learned from that is that, uh, you know, if you don't manage these things, you know, they can go away. Um, and, and, and therefore, I guess going forward, uh, you know, we do like to think that we... We try and optimize the benefits from, from, the, uh, from the PNG LNG project and other projects. I mean, you know, you know, Peter and, uh, and Richard here are also from the mining industry. And, and if things go well in, in certain things that they're doing, then, then not only are we talking about great revenues from our petroleum sector, but also from our, from our mining sector. I think part of the discussion is also symptomatic of where we are as a, as a growing community. I think the reality is, is that we have a a much more educated and exposed uh, you know, cadre of politicians, members of parliament, and certainly those of us who get to go into cabinet every now and then can see that the quality of debate um, and the quality of, of transparency that they uh, you know, are in, informing us that is expected from them. Um, you know, social media has done wonders in terms of the expectation of the community as to, uh, as to how the government is, is managing uh, uh, you know, the, the, the potential windfall revenues that come from a, from a PNG LNG project um, and, and other petroleum projects and other mining projects. I think we also need to, to, to focus on the fact that whilst we're projected to receive a lot of money, who knows what the price of oil is going to be in the future? I think part of <coughs> us having uh, had a, uh, you know, this boom before in terms of our resource revenues is to learn those lessons. And, and I think one of those things is, is we've got in place legislation such as the Fiscal Responsibility Act, 2006 I believe it is, which sets out the parameters on, on how we should manage our, our, our revenues coming in, 
and, and, and obviously, uh, uh, you know, the commissioner here, Boss Mary uh, Palazzo, can, can explain, you know, about some of those issues. But we, we talk about issues such as, you know, not allowing for tax holidays and being careful about where we give, uh, you know, tax concessions so that we do, again, maximize the opportunity that's available because these things are, uh, are non-renewable resources and they always run out. It, it talks about our debt so that we don't go and borrow too much for the future so that we pass on that liability to our to the next generation, and, and, and no matter how hard certainly our children work and the next generation of Papua New Guinea works, they're always having to pay off um, you know, what, what we have done now. Uh, it makes, uh, uh, it puts parameters on our, our, you know, our fiscal, uh, medium term you know, fiscal strategy, our, me our medium term uh, debt strategy. So all these parameters, I think, are, are, are lessons that we've learned. Um, and, and therefore, I guess now we would like to think that uh, having learnt from the, uh, the mistakes of having a, a mineral resources stabilisation fund, which had some governance issues, and, and we would like to think that you know, that didn't uh, yield the benefits that we'd like to yield. We had trust accounts now where, again, you know, for me, when, when something is in a trust account, I can't see it, and therefore our ability to track whether it's being used for the right reasons or not uh, are not as strong as we would like. So um, I like the way the question has been framed, Alan. It says, how are you going to manage these issues? Mm -hmm. Because you can't solve them. You know, all good things come with their, with their issues, and, and, the, and we'd like to think that having learnt from the past, we've got some measures in place um, that allow us to, uh, to manage, um, you know, the, the, the outcome and, and the outfall of, uh, of resource revenues going forward. Uh, thank you, Diary. I'll just go to Betty very quickly. Um, what proportion of funds are we talking about in terms of revenue streams coming to government? Now, obviously, you're getting money from a whole range of places, not just the extractive sector. Yes, we, we um, get the source, the revenue from all over the economy. Um, the resource ex resources sector plays, contributes a, a good portion of the revenue stream that comes to government. In a good year, it can be uh, up to 70 or 80 percent of um, the tax revenue collections that come into government. Uh, of course, it depends on commodity prices and, and issues like that and therefore that can impact on how much revenue comes in but um, we uh, get revenue through the resources sector uh, of course um, personal income tax other um, corporate income taxes goods and services tax etc but for us um, coming from uh, uh, the uh, internal revenue um, perspective what is important to us is, is ensuring that the resources sector and all other taxpayers in the economy are complying um, with their tax obligations, lodging on time, paying on time. Um, and we're also looking at uh, making our system more efficient to encourage uh, and make revenue collection more efficient. We are working on a new computer system. Uh, I think a number of companies here will, will know that we've now issued new forms, um, allowing them to be able to do electronic payments. So these are some of the things we are working at already to improve our revenue um, collection system to um, assist the government and of course um, my colleague diary over there is the one who will be in charge of managing <laughs> the revenues that come in. I, I see Martin itching on the other side there, Martin. I, I think in terms of uh, from the taxation pers perspective the EITA obviously involves uh, disclosure of tax information which under current legislation may there may be some difficulties. I understand there's a tax review underway. Are you looking at this disclosure issue and perhaps amendments to the Tax Act that will allow for the process of transparency in the reporting of taxes, particularly in relation to the uh, resource sector? <clears throat> yeah, um, the tax review is still going on. It hasn't um, completed its um, task yet, and I, I think a couple of the tax review um, secretariat members and, and the committee are here. Um, but yes, it is an issue because the Tax Act, um, there, there is a provision there that um, prevents the IRC from giving out um, details of taxpayers. But I think through the EITA, um, through that process, I think we're trying to get um, some of these details out. Uh, but for now, for us from the tax, um, in Income Tax Act perspective, <coughs> Um, it will also require the, the support and the agreement of the taxpayers, the, the companies in the resources sector, 
to allow us to be able to re release and disseminate any details. Practicality going forward with transparency, even if we're to observe sort of the law and ob observe you know contracts that are made between you know private entities and, and the government or private entities and themselves, at least on an aggregate level, you should be able to see what the flows are, yeah. which is probably more important than saying this particular company paid X Y Z. You can say as a, as a sector, um, you know they they are coming. So I think with the EITR, there'd be enough information there for uh, for anyone to extrapolate exactly what's going on. We'd like to think. Alan, if, if I could just add to that, uh, and when we, we're talking about the EITI, which is the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, um, one of the key cornerstones of that, uh, that uh, initiative is the cooperation between those three key stakeholders, government, industry, and civil society. Um, so there's, a, there's, in a sense, they commit themselves to an obligation of transparency. So uh, in terms of uh, the, the working group, uh, this is the work that's underway to establish the reporting framework that will support this initiative uh, in, in, uh, in order for us to allow to, uh, to, uh, to be able to um, firstly identify the kind of information we collect, um, the source of that information, and the level of detail within that information. But the, the principle that underpins it is, is a fully transparent uh, uh, public uh, availability of that information. So people are aware of the revenue that flows from industry into government, and the next conversation that should happen is what uh, is the flow of that uh, of those funds to the different uh, allocations within the government's obligations in, in terms of the services it delivers. Good point. Um, before we move on to the next question, um, uh, Secretary, you might want to explain how it is that you know we're talking about the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. How did it come about that Papua New Guinea became a part of it? I think the advent of the PNG LNG project is just such a large thing globally that it warrants us to, to be a part of the international community on how we deal with, with our extractive industries anyway. When I spent the first part of my career traveling the world trying to look for money for Papua New Guinea, and I used to walk into a boardroom and you'd have to explain to them, you know, we are Papua New Guinea, we are seven million people, we occupy the eastern half of the island of New Guinea and so on. Our claim to fame is we speak a quarter of the world's languages. Now you walk into any boardroom in the world and you say Papua New Guinea and they go, ah yes, PNG LNG. So I think we, we, we've gone from a, a sleepy little island in the, you know, a larger island in the, in the South Pacific to someone, and, and, and again, we're blessed. And not only is the, you know, we, what we don't have in quantity of our resources, our quality of gas is absolutely fantastic. It's exactly what the leading customers in China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are after. Um, and so I think as a growing country, you know, and certainly under the, the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill and, and his cabinet, um, and certainly... Um, you know, the Vulapindi House makeup and, and the policies that, and the contra, uh, constructs that, uh, you know, are guiding us. Uh, you know, the EITR is part of what I call my five-stage continuum. You know, and the first one is to try and optimize your opportunities in, in both sectors, yeah? So I think with the, you know, and you hear it later on throughout the discussion, no doubt, when we talk about the Kumul companies, you know, having a Kumul mining and having a Kumul petroleum, you know, we've got all these different companies running around doing different things. Why don't we put them all in one place and then you get a group of core Papua New Guineans and international experts that are, you know, resource-specific and sector-specific and, 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 and so that we maximize that opportunity. You know, moving into uh, areas such as, um, you know, the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and again, I don't want to touch, you know, touch on a little bit because I think it's a big part of the discussion going forward, but, but having a, you know, a mechanism to, to efficiently, responsibly manage the windfall of these things so that, you know, one, we, you know, I, you know being an economist, we're always worried about maximizing the opportunity, but also maximizing responsibly. Uh, and so that, uh, you know, as we always say when we're trying to do these public forums, you may all got to get one plot built us all out, and if you eat too much, you get sick, and the economy's like that. And, and this, this project and other projects, when you, when you bung them all together, they can have the effect of overheating your economy, and then the negative effects and Dutch disease or resource curse that, that we all read about and we all think about may actually occur. You know, with the Sovereign Wealth Fund, then you have to have, you know, transparency initiatives, not only, you know, in, in, in your extractive industries, but in other areas. I think in terms of how we're managing the budget as a whole, a part of the Fiscal Responsibility Act is for us to have a, you know, I'm new in Treasury, but they call it the MAIFO, the Mid-Year Economic and Fiscal Outlook, which is, uh, which is due out later on this afternoon, which shows us our report card for uh, how we're going throughout the year. And we also have a, a final budget outcome, which we publish uh, at the end of the first quarter, which shows us how we went last year. So you don't have to wait until 2015 budget to find out how you went for the 2014 year. So, so I think transparency is becoming 
uh, you know, it's just a way of life. It's just something that we have to deal with. And, and certainly I know now that there's a lot of conjecture about some of the things that the government has done over the last six or seven months. And I keep telling my staff, you know, in other mature countries, this is the level of scrutiny that government should be under anyway. Um, but I do just make the quick point while I'm here on the EITI in, in terms of Martin's question. Not only is it the flowing, you know, tracking the flow of revenues from a transparency perspective, but actual project agreements. You know, how are we dealing with environmental issues? How are we dealing with landowners? How are we dealing with national content issues? You know, I think there's the opportunity with the EITI to also publish these things as well so that everyone can see. I, I, I know in terms of Ramu Nico, there's a court order which says that public uh, you know, these project agreements should be out there in, in, in the public. Um, uh, the EITI and transparency, other transparency initiatives also allow us to be able to attract good policy, you know, and I think we've got a program right now with the, uh, with the IMF and the National uh, Bu uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, sorry, which is looking at improving the quality and reliability of our statistics. You know, with this transparency, it also allows us to say, well, we're taking along, you know, we're pumping more money out into the districts, more money out into the LLGs, into the provinces. For us to be able to report on those, we can say how we can safeguard and, 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 and strengthen these areas. And I think the last one, Alan, in, in, in my continuum is, is we don't make uh, enough of it, but when we passed the budget last year, the, you know, this, this government also had the foresight to, to put in place the legislation for our independent commission against corruption. So not only can we see where something is going wrong in terms of the revenue flows or, or, or the practices, but we need to be able to prosecute those that go act actively go out to subvert the way that things are supposed to be done in Papua New Guinea. Um, yeah. Maybe by, by way of background, just with respect to EITI, of course, globally, it came about because a lot of developing countries with resources, particularly in places like West Africa, we're receiving a lot of revenue or receiving, uh, exporting a lot of uh, produce and, uh, but didn't seem to actually be achieving that sort of development outcomes. And of course, the 1990s, as Secretary uh, highlighted, was a case in point. Yes, 1992, we had one of the highest growth rates in the world. But mm. the next few years, we went through swings and troughs and budget deficits and uh, a series of structural adjustment programs. So. We need to be learning those lessons from uh, PNG's past, but also from around the world. And EITI was all about trying to minimize and the Publish What You Pay initiative mm -hmm. that sort of helped lead up to the EITI to try and help uh, ensure awareness and to, to minimize these Dutch disease, mm -hmm. resource curse. Uh, and a lot of that is, is based upon the need of public awareness. And, and as we know, yes, a lot more people are aware of things on social media and, and so on now. But if you go out of this fairly, still fairly small network of social media, out into the rural areas, there are very much information is certainly not about budget uh, revenue or expenditure. It's really about survival and access to the local market, access to the local health center and so on. Fairly fundamental things. So. Thank, you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I was just going to say, Alan, just add on to what Paul is saying. Uh, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's the right time for us as well. In my first engagement with the EITI was about six or seven years ago. And the issue that I had with the EITI back then was I thought it was a bit elitist. I had a problem with foreigners in boards far, far away passing judgment on my little country while we're trying to build it. I think the EITI has moved on from that and, you know, led by the Norwegians who, you know, who, who and talk about sovereign wealth funds, they've got the largest and probably the most successful uh, sovereign wealth fund. But they led the charge for the developing world to be members of the, uh, of the sovereign wealth fund. You know? and, and we, in terms of us now being a candidate country, we're going through this process with the United States of America and, and Britain and France are moving on. You know? Australia has a pilot project, but they haven't signed on to be a candidate country. So uh, again, there, there, there's one area. Uh, you know, the EITI has matured to a stage where I think it's relevant for us. Thank you, Secretary. So, uh, well, just before yeah. you move on, I think history is important. And I'm going to take off my chamber hat and put my civil society hat on. <laughs> and uh, Tr Transparency International, together with civil society, have been working on EITI and other integrity initiatives um, for, for, the, for the past 15 years. And uh, in more, probably about seven to eight years ago, uh, TI took uh, the initiative and, and worked with state agencies, but primarily working with civil society, grew that demand, grew that understanding uh, and, and the importance for EITI. So it's, um, it's, been, a, um, it's, it's been an initiative driven by civil society as well. You know? So that's an important fact. And 
Thank you Having for that. said that, I'll put my chamber hat back on again. <laughs> you can put your chamber hat back on. You're with Tanim Ground. Uh, we now go to a question from the audience. Uh, if, if you can find Alicia. Alicia, you can now ask your question, please. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Alicia from the UN Human Rights Office. I was going to ask a question about the government's position on transparency and how revenues um, are coming into the government and how those revenues being spent. But I think a lot has been spoken about that already. Um, so I guess my other question is how, what efforts are the government, is the government taking or planning to take to translate that so that's understandable for the everyday Papua New Guinean, especially for landowners um, and people whose resources are being utilized by these um, types of extractive industries, but also for the everyday Papua New Guinean, as we were saying, who don't live on social media, um, who maybe don't have access to newspaper, or if there's efforts through the radio, because part of transparency would be not just for the international community to understand how these revenues are being spent, but for Papua New Guineans themselves to have that understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Well, anyone in the panel want to go? <coughs> Maybe Maya? perhaps if I can <coughs> address that issue. Um, civil society, in terms of the ITI process, um, it's made up of um, three stakeholders being industry, government, and civil society. And I think civil society, we take it upon ourselves to be the, 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 um, the, the, the party that takes the information out, not only about you know, being holding perhaps the government and the industry accountable, but we're also about taking that information out to the public, to the citizens, and telling them this is what's happening in our country. This is what money is coming in. This is how the government is using it. And this is what you should be holding your leaders accountable to. And so we see our role as civil society is doing that. And so not only do we do it at the MSG level, but we hope to take it out there to the people once we are able to get the information. Once we have a report, I mean, this is a report that's Trinidad and Tobago. So this is what we're hoping to produce uh, by 2016. And we want to take a great, fantastic book like this uh, and that has fantastic infomo infographics and take it as a very digestible information for Papua New Guinean citizens to say, this is what's going on in our country. If you're not happy about it, you should do something about it. And it's all about civil society using the EITA process to create that sense of empowerment and creating a higher level of accountability through information for our ordinary Papua New Guinean citizens. So I think we look on, on, on Martin does it in his way with the blogging that he does. And I do it my way by taking out the information to the people that I come into contact with um, in the civil society work that I do. TIPNG is also a member of the MSG as well, and they are very vocal in the work that they do in terms of anti-corruption and good governance work. So, you know, it, we're hoping that, you know, it's going to be a fantastic process for Papua New Guineans to understand what's happening in their country. And EITA is just a great vehicle in order to make that happen. Just a step Peter. Just sort of to add to that, uh, the EITI, in terms of its, uh, uh, of its operations, uh, you know, sort of works on some fundamental pillars. Uh, and as I said in my opening statement, I mean, the, the first is the cooperation between these three key stakeholders. The second is the capturing of that information, uh, which allows uh, that, that information to be, to be identified, firstly, uh, and then underneath that, a framework that is able to then provide that information to a level of detail that will allow organisations like TI and churches and other groups that have an interest here including mm -hmm. landowner groups, to be able to understand the flow of revenues between these two parties and hopefully in, in EITI plus uh, also the flow of revenues uh, from the government and from, uh, from industry or from companies to, the in, to these individual parties, whether it be landowners, local level government, provincial government. And, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, if you start to, to um, develop that type of discipline through the system, then it may also go a little further to support the kind of um, decentralised budgeting process that the government is, is underpinning some of its development strategies around now. Because the issue for us will always be capacity within these lower arms of government and their ability to manage this, this flow of income. And as we've seen with landowner groups, it's also the inability for them to manage the flow of income that they generate as a result of the, the resource. While I'm on, this, on the topic, I just want to just to, to say to people that you know, the wealth of PNG is a shared wealth between all of us, not just individual landowners. But it's up to us and the government to work together to make sure that wealth 
is realized across the broader community, not just individual pockets. Thank you. Um, Secretary, if I may go to you first. Um, how is senior government taking this, 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 you know, uh, this revenue, uh, looking at the revenue and the transparency of surrounding it, particularly coming from the extractive industries? How are they receiving it? Uh, well, let, let's break your question into two parts, uh, Alan. Uh, how are they taking it, the, the fact that the revenue is coming? Everyone's excited. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, our job, in a sense, is to try and temper that excitement. And, and I think if I'm hearing Alicia's uh, question correctly, you know, the, the, the logistics around the communication strategy is absolutely key. Y you know, in, in a sense, sometimes you hear in, you know, amongst our political leadership and certainly senior management at, at the bureaucratic level, you know, the idea that, you know, we've been f fasting for so long that when it does arrive, we start to spend very, very quickly. And, and, uh, and again, that's what happened in, you know, with, the, with, the, with the oil wealth. You know, immediately there was an import binge as, as people went out and started to buy all these you know, nice shiny things. And unfortunately, a lot of those nice shiny things were down here in Port Moresby and not enough was you know, back at home uh, in, in, in the Southern Highlands and, and, and what is now the, the, the Hella province. So uh, I, th I think for us to be able to, you know, in a sense, to temper, to temper the, uh, the, um, you know, the excitement that, that, that comes with the horizon around, sunlight around the corner, and I think, therefore, having you know, limits such as your Fiscal Responsibility Act, which says that uh, you, know, you can only spend this amount of money in a particular period, and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, again, which will say that while that money is there, you can, you know, in a given period, depending on these you know, economic conditions, you can only draw down a, a certain amount of money, uh, is our attempt to manage all of that. And there also needs to be a lot more understanding of some of the concepts. People hear about GDP. Wow, an enormous great GDP growth, but what is GDP? And GDP doesn't mean an increased, that level of increased economic activity that Papua New Guineans are involved in, but it also doesn't mean that translates into revenue. Revenue is sometimes further down the track, and that was, you know, as we know, in the 1990s, some of those new projects didn't actually start paying revenue until, I'm not looking yeah. at you, Peter, um, <laughs> until sort of 15 years or so later. Yeah, mm. Completely. And, and, and I think, you know, coming back to Alicia's question, this, this idea of communicating and making, you know, being able to manage expectations is, is, is going to be a, a, a key part of that. Uh, you, know, you know, being sort of in the engine room, you know, our, our, apart from the, you know, the uh, I guess the aesthetic uh, benefits of, of being transparent, you know, from an efficiency uh, perspective, you know, transparency is key. Uh, again, one of my issues with, uh, with the EITI initially was that it was, it was at a very high level. I mean, for us, we want to be able to track flows from, you know, from the company to the government, and then from the government all the way down to the household level or the community level and the village level. Cause, and then that's what the EIT I wasn't focusing on previously, because that's where a lot of the leakage is. It's not only the national government, you know, to buy to you know, what it needs to do, but also from the national government to the to the provincial government, and the provincial government to the local level government. You know, from the landowners to service providers around the area. That's where a lot of the the uh, the leakages can be. And and again, I, I can't uh, you know talk enough about the the advent of social media. There is just an expectation that to be a you know a leader. Not only do you come under the leadership code, which is the ombudsman, but you also come under the, you know, in a sense, the, the, the transparency code of social media, and, 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 and as we should. And, and, and the same with, with, uh, with cabinet, and the same with parliament. So it's just becoming a way of life. Whether you like it or not, it is going to start to pervade more and more elements of, 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 of financial management, but social management, um, at, at, certainly at the government level, but, you know, and also at, uh, at every other level in the, in the community. Alan, I think yeah. we should balance this. And Papua New Guinea, um, as, as a country, and in our uh, mining and, and petroleum legislation and regulation, has existing framework, and we're developing, continue to develop that framework. But we've had uh, existing framework uh, w with which engages our people, from the landowners to local level government, uh, provincial government, and, and national government. So it's not that this has not been happening before. Um, this has been. This is how this was structured uh, post independence, and we've continued to to, to grow that. So, so I, I think it's very important to, to for our audience and and, and uh, viewers around the country to to, to appreciate that these are, we're not waiting for PNG LNG to do all these things. The structures are there, but what we need to do is shine that torch on that process, and mm -hmm. and as Secretary said, for, further down, because it's not just at government and, and between the government and the corporation. You know, there's, there's a accountability and a responsibility for that accountability 
uh, through to local level, provincial governments, local level governments, and within the landowners themselves to their own constituents. Hmm. Uh, so there seems to be this, um, uh, th this assertion that it's, it's uh, on one side of that equation. So that's very, very important to do. And I think the process of uh, EITI will make that pr provide a frame framework to, to give it some guidance, but that's not the panacea of it all. And it will take us, it will take us time to, to, to develop that. So it's, it's a very important point to be made. Thank you, Richard. On that point, I was going to say let's go to commercial, but um, we're going to go and view a video question now, uh, if, if the guys up there are ready. But this will, this comes off nicely from what you're just saying. So let's go to the video question. Hi, my name is Rihanna Gabi. I come from Mumbai province, and I have a question for the panel. If natural resources in this country are our birthrights, where can we see how our money earned from it is being spent? Thank you. Well, there you go. You've been put on the spot now, panel. Where can they see it? Where can young people see it? Where can landowners? Where can we see it now? Well, Alan, can, yep. I, can I try and address that? Well, <coughs> I'm, I'm a writer, and where do I go to look for information like this? If, if, if a resource company is listed on a stock exchange, they have a, an obligation to report the, the, the revenues that they make. So, for instance, Oil Search or Barrick would put out a notice to the stock exchange or whether it's an annual report or whether it's just a, a report about something, they're, some big decision they're making. Um, so you'll find it a lot on the company's website. Um, in PNG, one of the biggest companies is Octedi. Unfortunately, they are, they are, may, maybe uh, the tre Treasury Secretary can explain why their website has been taken offline for a long time now. Um, but Octedi had very good data. Some of us could track from when it was uh, when it began production, the production levels, um, the revenue that it made, you could track that information on the Octeri web website. Unfortunately, it's not available at the moment for some reason. Um, so if you have internet access wherever you are in the country, you can find it on the company website, depending on which company you're interested. And hopefully, with the TI process, um, that information will be readily available from various sources. What if you don't have internet? Access. Can you go up to your local district office, say, up in Tari, for instance? Can you do that? Can you get some information? I, I think you should be able to. Uh, and, and again, when we're talking about the, the, you know, the communication hmm. uh, strategy around these things and the logistics, you know, one thing that we've we've found to be very successful uh, over the last five or six years is to use partnerships that are already on the ground. Uh, you know, for the PNG LNG project, which where I spent most of my career until I moved into Treasury, you know, our, our partnership with Exxon Mobil has allowed us to to get you know socio-economic data and socio-economic messages, socio-economic policies into areas that we couldn't previously do. You know, not also, and, and now that you know we are in this uh, in this sweet spot where the quality of partnership are these large. Um, companies that have not only our rules to follow, but their own internal rules and then the international rules to follow. Um, you know, we can u utilize them. Uh, and Octet has been around for a while. Um, also churches, you know, and youth groups. I think the government hasn't uh, done a good enough job of, of trying to harness the energy and, and the potential to, to utilize those, those uh, you know, uh, civil society organizations uh, to disseminate information and, and, and certainly um, you know, in a sense, we've been bound by a, you know, not having enough money in the, in the past, so it would be nice to have a representative of, of uh, you know, the, whether it's the mining sector or the, or the petroleum, uh, Department of Petroleum and Energy or MRA out in each of the areas. But, but I think you know, we, when we use the technological platforms of today, um, you know, through the internet and, and through, your, through your SMS, we've got B Mobile and Digicel, which, uh, you know, which you do very well. And, and hopefully in the next couple of months, you know, we will have up to 92% of the country covered with, uh, with mobile coverage. So I think it's getting better in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the logistics of being able to do it. I think we just got to sort of now make it a, a, a point to do it and, and get out there and, and start disseminating the information. But, but every year, there's a very impressive document that it comes out. The budget estimates, which are presented to Parliament. Multiple books. Uh, yes, it is available on the, uh, on the internet, if you have it. But clearly, for ordinary people's lives out there, they need that information, mm. not just at the national level, but the provincial level and right down to the district level. And that's a, 
a real challenge and in a way it needs to be mandatory that it is yeah. out there. And just taking an example from a different country, in uh, the 1990s, early 1990s in, uh, in Uganda, they found that 80% of the education money was not actually ending up in the education sector in the schools. And there was such a shock as a result of this survey that they, uh, they introduced all kinds of new, new laws and the requirement that the budgets were posted right down to the local school level. At the end of the 1990s, in that country, 80% was getting to the schools. There was still wastage, but substantially more was actually reaching its destination. So this process of transparency right down to the, the local level and translated into a manner that people can understand mm. is really critical. And then the community can participate in actually monitoring and you need obviously a mechanism so you can report back if the money actually isn't going there. I think let's uncomplicate this. The responsibility of government is to provide basic services. So to answer the young lady's question, um, are we getting basic education, school services, community school, secondary school services, basic health services, uh, some roads, uh, some communication? And I think to our community, if we're not getting that, then there's an issue. So, so I, I think we, we really don't need reports to tell us that. So um, those of us who are fortunate to live in Port Moresby have seen some fantastic developments here. Um, the people outside of Port Moresby and, and out, outside of, in the central province and, and the rest of the country aren't seeing that. So, so I think, Alan, the key thing to, to our people is that are we getting this? And, and if we're not, we need to, and this is what this accountability is all about. And, and money is also going to look in the decentralized government system Money is also going to uh, um, uh, local level governments. Are they, are they delivering that as well? So I think we need to keep this simple with our people and say, that's the first test. That's the first test. And Richard, I, mean, I think that's the value of something like an EITI. As you mentioned earlier, it's not the solution for everything, uh, but it does become an important tool for us in terms of promoting transparency. Um, so through a mechanism like EITI, um, you firstly capture that information and then you have interested groups uh, and this is really where the work starts with these interested groups like this is TI, and if and if we do mobilise the, ne uh, the, the 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 huge network within churches, uh, they uh, are able to dissect this information down to a form which is uh, understood by our people, and then through those networks, if we're able to mobilise them, to able to get that information into the hands of that community, so that young girl there can, for instance, uh, if we're down in Alatau can understand that provincial budget, can understand perhaps what's going to her school, and then if she's committed enough, and if she's encouraged by groups like TI through the Youth Against Corruption Alliance, uh, is able to mobilise their young people there to monitor that, as Paul suggested. There was a time here when we we'd spoke about, about doing scoreboards at marketplaces on the provincial budgets that were handed out. So those types of initiatives, if we're able to mobilise this type of group uh, with that understanding, can, can, can bring a, a benefit in terms of that, that transparency trail. And, and I, I completely agree. I mean, you know, taking, taking on to Paul's point, um, you know, we're a hyper democratic community. <laughs> you know, we really are. The, uh, I think the community is, is very receptive to all that kind of information. And you see it around election time. Huh? Every five years, everybody knows what the budget, what's in the budget, what's been spent, and what's going to, sp what's going to be spent. I think what we need to try and do is do that on a more timely basis, on a more periodic basis. Huh? So you keep everybody interested from a year to year rather than every five years when there's an election on. Good point. Yes. Add to that, um, to, to answer the young girl's question. I think for the, the simple Papua New Guinea out there in a rural area or on a remote island, um, for them to see what uh, revenue translates to is services like, like an aid post in a very remote island, um, the ability to get to a, a um, school, um, road infrastructure, etc. Um, a lot of times, um, from the perspective of the tax office, um, when we try to get people um, in the private sector to comply, especially in the rural areas, they'd say, what's in it for me? Um, mm. So we'll need, we then have to say things like, OK, you, you can then see your children going to school, getting an education, or getting uh, um, services mm. at the hospital. And this is all what our revenue translates to. 
um, the government will then be able to buy, uh, sorry, pay for, to build hospitals or um, schools. And for the uh, ordinary person out in the rural areas of Papua New Guinea, they will understand it better when we explain it in, in these terms. Thank you very much. Uh, and they may even know that when a vehicle comes along saying generously donated by someone, <laughs> it actually was not, it was generously <laughs> donated from their own <laughs> pocket. So what we should do is, um, where it says donated by member so-and-so, we'll say, no, this was donated by all the mining companies in Papua New Guinea, <laughs> <laughs> all the extractive no, industries. No, 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 it's correct, that. <laughs> by all taxpayers. That's it's your allocation yeah. in the... Including uh, your budget. own GST payments. That's right. yes. <laughs> so it's not from the member. Okay, we move into our next segment. You're with Tanim Ground. We'll cut to the talk out segment. Um, let's have a look at our talk out segment. My name is uh, Donald, Donald Hehona. When I, when I joined in 2010, we, I helped the department to try to push the initiative on uh, EITI in the country and how, uh, how we can uh, get the country to sign up to the EITI. The EITI is an abbreviation for the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. It's a global initiative and it's, it's basically Looking in initiative, looking into the uh, revenues in the extractive industries. The benefits about getting Papua New Guinea to sign up to EITI can be thought of in, in so many ways. Uh, one of it, of course, is to improve governance in, in you know, managing the revenues from oil and gas and mining sectors. The other, the other benefit that you can think of and you can ask yourself why, that, why do we push Papua New Guinea to sign up to EITI is, uh, is uh, improving PNG business environment. How does uh, EITI play that role? When you report the revenues that come from the extractive industries and how the government spends those revenues, it creates confidence in the private sector's mind, in, in somebody who wants to come and invest here creates confidence in his mind that he will come and invest in an environment that, that is gonna, you know, the revenues are gonna be used to build the nation. So at the moment there is more than 30 countries implementing EITI. Some are candidate countries, some are EITI validated countries. In some countries, in, in other parts of the world, there are some countries who have done this process and they have exhausted the whole process and they've, they've become a compliant country and they question themselves what is there for us to do next. So for instance in Timor-Leste they've, they've exhausted the process and they became a compliant country so the next thing they did was they've created an online portal and they consider that as beyond EITI. Now in other countries they once they've completed the process they became, they became compliant countries they expand their reporting scope to consider revenue is coming in from the forestry and fisheries sectors. So that's what's happened to other countries when they've reached the process to be a validated country or be a compliant country. As of 19 March 2014, Papua New Guinea became a candidate country. What does that mean for us as, uh, as Papua New Guineans you know, becoming a candidate country? That simply means that in the next 18 months, we will have to have our first report done a report detailing all the revenues that we receive from different uh, mining oil and mining companies in the country and how those funds were spent in terms of service delivery in the country so in the first 18 months we need to have that report and that report needs to be submitted to the international secretariat and the board will have you know will go through that and determine whether we are compliant or not as it is now, uh, work is driven by the Department of Treasury and there's a small secretariat led by myself as the interim national coordinator. But that should change in the next couple of months time when we recruit the national coordinator and the staff of the national secretariat. Uh, my name is Sionioa. I'm the team leader for the Sornwell Fund 
Implementation Secretariat, which we are based in the Wulpindi House. Uh, yeah. So with the Sonor Fund work, the revenues are expected from the uh, mineral and petroleum uh, sector, including the PNG LNG project, will give rise to microeconomic pressures such as the exchange rate appreciation or the so-called Dutch disease, uh, higher liquidity, and the higher overall, uh, uh, overall within, the, within the economy. This will undermine the competitiveness of our uh, non-mineral sectors in the economy, such as the agriculture sector. We will have more money f like flowing around uh, in the economy, which like Bank of PNG can manage, manage to uh, like lots of cash uh, flowing around within the economy, but that will like have impact on the, on the price of goods, goods and services. Because once we have lots of money in the economy, there's a competitor to buy the buy a, buy a, those goods and services, and that will increase the price of those goods and services. Which, like our people, well, people will like uh, suffer from those higher prices. So those are the reasons why the uh, Swanol Fund uh, Secretaries Committee, through the Implementing Secretariat, is uh, doing all this policy work and establishing the structural and institutional framework to uh, have this uh, mechanism in place to manage these uh, large inflows of uh, revenues from the mineral and petroleum sector. So the, uh, mineral, uh, the re revenues uh, from the mineral and petroleum sector we flow from the from those uh, from the Sonor Fund uh, into the into the into the uh, national budget. That's through the uh, Waikani uh, Consolidated Revenue Fund. From uh, from the Securities Committee, they establish uh, a working group, and then I implement the Secretariat to implement this uh, Sonor Fund. And the Secretariat is made up of uh, Department of Treasury, Department of National Planning and Monitoring. Department of Justice and Attorney General and uh, Bank of PNG. So we have officers uh, seconded from these uh, departments attached to the Secretariat. And they are currently based in, uh, within the Department of Treasury. Let's break it down into something simple, so particularly for our viewers out there. Um, th there were a few issues raised, uh, things like, um, you know, getting those services, and Betty, you mentioned that, uh, getting it right down to those village areas, those rural communities. Um, how, how does all of this come together? I mean, we, we're looking at uh, what your people have just spoken about, Secretary, in terms of um, all the stuff that government is trying to do, setting up this... Uh, uh, secretariat setting that up, you know, we're setting up so many things, but how does it work in simple terms? If it, sure, sure, Alan. Let me just say, those of you who watched that little, uh, yeah, little info video there, you'll notice that uh, since I joined the Department of Treasury, there's more people shaving their heads. <laughs> uh, I think they see it as a, as a way to fast. It is a trend, isn't it? It yeah. is a trend. Yeah. Yeah. Minister Abel started and we're all there. <laughs> uh, I, 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 you know, I, again, you know, I was explaining to, to, to the team that was looking at the uh, Australian, Bu you know, the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the, uh, the IMF team looking at our uh, at our own national statistics office the other day that, in a sense, we're chasing the ball a little bit. You know, a lot of countries have the luxury of working a path to development. You know, for us, development is landing on us, and, and therefore we're we're working very hard to try and put those institutions and those structures in place to ensure that that, that our people do uh, get to see and and, and get, get to. Uh, Enjoy and, and afford the uh, you know the benefits that can come from uh, from the opportunity in the in the mining and petroleum sectors. Uh, I think we need to say that under you know under Peter O'Neill and, and and his cabinet um, and of course the current treasurer who was you know who was experienced treasurer previously in in, 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 in the other governments in the in previous governments, you know they are flushing more resources and more money out into the districts than has ever been before. You know in terms of their provincial support infrastructure you know, improvement programs their district support improvement programs and the LLG um, support improvement programs. So the intention of government is quite clear in terms of giving money out to the districts. And we think of a member of a district, for example, who gets, you know, what is it, 5 million kina a year for, or 10 million kina a year for five years. That's 50 million kina. That's a lot of money. And, and so the intention of government 
is to try and push the money out there. Now, what we have to do with initiatives such as the, you know, the EITI, but uh, I said at public accounts committees when we go through the audits of uh, and the accounts of provincial governments, and I think national planning, you know, the national planning office, they give them, or the department, sorry, they give them some guidance in terms of spend X percent on education, X percent on health, and X percent on infrastructure, and so on. And, and one of these things, like the EI, must be you must spend X percent on compliance. You know, you must have the you know people who are you know accountants who can account for all of these things. And when you get uh, the the auditor general's office comes out, and when they do an audit on how you've been spending your money, again we should publish that at the you know at, at the provincial level or at the at the local level. In, in, in a very timely way, but, but, and, and also when the Auditor General writes back with management letters and says, these are the areas which we think you need you know, help or attention over the next year or so, well, can you please explain this? You know, again, these districts and these, these provinces must have the, uh, the capacity to be able to answer those, and then if they need to come and ask Treasury for, for some more help in terms of, or, or maybe Treasury puts out that in the budget, you know, we're going to put, you know, X million kina for everybody to, to look at your compliance issues. Because I think, you know, we're trying to flush money out and the Parliament and the, and, the, and the Cabinet and this government is trying to flush the money out there. But not only do you ask Waigani, what's your intention in terms of how the people are going to feel the benefits of this? We've also got to localise that and, and ask the local member and, and ask the provincial government, you know, how are you guys making sure that what, all that money that the government is giving you is going where it's supposed to as well. But you do have weak planning and management systems and certainly weak accounting systems. And as we know, uh, when in, uh, some of the managers don't really take the accounting process seriously, we know that the Auditor General really has to thump the yeah. table to try and get financial yeah. statements out of them. And the, the audit reports are effectively years out of date by the time they actually come through to, uh, to Parliament. So some big challenges there. And of course, as we know, uh, members of Parliament are elected as representatives, not really as project planners and managers, and yet they're virtually thrust into that, f that uh, role. Um, going to the uh, civil, civil sec sector here, uh, Maya, what sort of demands and for what sort of information does civil society, since you're speaking on their behalf, I guess, wh what do they demand? What sort of information Look, do they want? <clears throat> Unfortunately, I don't think civil society know what they want because the dearth, the lack of information, the lack of coordination in civil society, unfortunately, it has to be said, it, it is, is sadly not there. Um, of course, the church is very strong in the country, but just to have a general collaboration, um, a, a presence out there that is more able to take advantage of, there, there is information available, but just to take advantage of the information and disseminate it more readily amongst the people in the provinces, I mean, the ability for civil society to do that, unfortunately, isn't as, there as strong as it should be. That's why I, I was mentioning earlier that EITI is such a fantastic tool for, for uh, uh, civil society to organize themselves around a particular issue and to get information out there that's sorely needed amongst our Papua New Guinean citizens. Um, I think one of the, a good program, I think, which Paul, um, I think it's CIMC, I believe, that's the budget tracking initiative that they have, which is, it, it's the actual people in the villages are actually looking at the way budgets are being, being um, rolled out within their provinces, within their communities. And they're actually asking and, and calling on leaders to be more accountable for how they are using or not using money within the community. So that is just an example how it's from the grassroots up. And unfortunately, there is a lack of capacity you know, amongst uh, provincial governments, uh, local level governments, either, and, and, and civil society, as I've said. And how do we get people on the ground who have the capacity to be able to look at budget documents and say, this is the way things are supposed to be happening, and then the community that then use that as an advocacy tool to say, well, it's not good enough. What are we going to do about it as a community? You see, so it's, it's very difficult, you know, as a civil society to start you know, saying, well, let's start taking control, let people in the villages, people in the provinces start talking out more, let, don't let it just be a Waigani or, or at least a, a Port Moresby driven, driven issue. So I hope to see that EITI is going to be used as a tool to start getting more information out into the communities. So, Martin, your readership. Yeah, well, the thing is, it's, it's very important, I think, in the, in the discussion about the, the transparency issue because what it says is extractive industries transparency in initiative, which, you know, in a way, the, the, the discourse that goes up is usually financial transparency, but the nuances around what people are looking for, the information that people are looking for, 
on the ground are, are, are varied. You know, for someone along the Fly River, for instance, perhaps what they need is the environmental monitoring information, which can allow them to negotiate their compensation packages. So that that would be something that perhaps someone uh, at, at the uh, and you know in Ramonico, for instance, the landowners had a big court case over environmental issues. So perhaps they might find information about the environmental monitoring and reporting very important. So these are the things we have to be uh, weary about as to well. how, how do people value information, what sort of information is, is necessary for. Are they interested in how much Exxon pays to government or do they want to know how much of the MOA or BSA benefits were paid out? <laughs> you know, this, so it's, it's very important that these conversations happen with those on the ground so we, we can figure out what they want and we include them in the uh, report that eventually comes out in 2016, so that that report is relevant to people on the ground in Papua New Guinea. So that's, I think, my view on the type of information we should be thinking around in, in developing the reporting framework for this country. Technology is bridging the gap in how you can deliver the information to people. <coughs> um, a lot of work's been done around the world on using SMS platforms. Uh, to get information, so you know, by 2016, technology would have moved a lot, and perhaps we'd have greater mobile coverage in this country by then. So we could use technology to bridge that information gap and get to people what's relevant for them. Martin, you, you raised this point. Let me just clarify that with respect to the first EITI report. I can tell you now, it's going to be focused on revenue, and uh, it's not designed. And it's important for us to to make the public aware. It's not de designed to talk about uh, the environmental aspects at this point in time. So it's a first step. And the first step also is um, revenue coming from, uh, coming from the attractive industry to national government. Um, and and uh, this will allow an introductory platform for us to work in, in, in the first report. Um, the intention is to extend that to provincial governments and then uh, subsequently down to local level governments and, and, and eventually to, to landowners. So um, it, we, we need to take some baby steps to, to, to get the um, structures in place, to get, get that reporting mechanisms going, and there may be some uh, relevant legislation that, that may be necessary. Um, uh, the, the demand for that remains and as an important demand, but with EITI, that platform that with the discussions on revenue and uh, empowering civil society, getting uh, corporations to, to have a better understanding as well, and then having a relationship with government to, to sit in a room and, and have these discussions, will provide the impetus uh, for, for us to expand, expand that out and have the necessary uh, discourse on, on some of the other subjects that you're talking about. So, so we don't want to raise too, much, too, too high an expectation for our first report in 2016. Uh, it's going to have a limited framework, but it's a start. And, and one of the key things that, uh, already uh, that uh, we from the chamber uh, are encouraged by is the uh, uh, ability for us to sit with the state, sit with civil society, and talk about something of, of common ground uh, uh, where we're not antagonistic towards each other. So I just want to say we've got to take these baby steps and, and um, and, and move that so we just keep keep track on the reality of what, what we're going to achieve. Remember that it's, it's not simply about mining oil companies transferring, ma mm. making payments to the tax office and customs. There's also other mechanisms of transparency. There is state-owned enterprises and we know that there's a lot of lack of clarity at this stage of where the, the flow. Some goes to the treasury some is retained in IPBC, and then they s actually do spending themselves. But there's also the whole question of accountability by landowner companies. Mm -hmm. They're going to be major recipients of some of the resource wealth. They've got also to be accountable uh, for, their, for, for their revenue to their own communities. Mm. Well, that's the second stage. I'll just, answer in, in, just clarifying that in the 2016 report, mm -hmm. we're not going to be going that way. We're, we're starting um, in stage step one. Step by step. Mm. Let, let's move on. Um, we have a Twitter question from Sarah Hughes, um, and Secretary, you were talking about this earlier. How does EITI fit with efforts, other efforts, including the Sovereign Wealth Fund? You mentioned ICAC, uh, you know, the Kumul Trust, and so on and so forth. Maybe, maybe let's have some discussion around that. 
Sure, well, let, let me start and then, 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 then the panel can jump in where they, where they see fit. But, uh, again, part, part of the, in my view, part of the, the wastage that's occurred over you know, the last 25 years or so is because as, a, as, a, you know, as P&G Incorporated, if you like, we haven't been able to put our best foot forward. Um, you know, in other jurisdictions, you know, you take you know, Australia and America, for example, the, the government doesn't need to be involved. And, and again, I'm a, you know, I'm a free market economist myself, so smaller government is, is, is where I am ideologically. But for the fact that it, in our market, it's distorted. So if you always have a big company versus a little landowner, then the big company always wins. So I think there's a, a very real and very present role for the government to be in that middle, in that middle place. Um, and, and, and when you see how successful it's been with, you know, the Brazilian companies such as Petrobras or the Malaysian, you know, Petronas, I mean, these are some of the great, you know, companies of the world. Or, or I like Sonangol in Angola, which is now buying Portuguese assets, uh, you know, which would be great if at some stage our Papua New Guineans are buying Australian assets. I think that would be a, a great story. So I think being able to consolidate, you know, and then again, not appointing you know, friends of ministers or, you know, people from the party, but going out there and finding some of the best uh, executives, uh, you know, the best managers, the best directors, and, and, and some of them are Papua New Guineans, and we've got great success stories from the likes of Visikeli Tareka. These two gentlemen sitting uh, on, on, on either side of you and I, Alan, mm. um, Gerea at Oil Search and, and Ila Temu at, at, at Barrick. I mean, we, we've got a great pool of Papua New Guineans that we can now draw on to be not only working for foreign companies and realising shareholder value there, but yeah, working for our companies and, and, and trying to realise shareholder value over there. We also don't have to do all of these things ourselves. I mean, let's go out there and get some of the brightest and the best directors uh, internationally, you know, to lift our game. We don't know everything and we, don't, we, 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 we shouldn't fool ourselves that we need to do all our things on our own. If we can have access to some great people, uh, and again, you know, and make sure that the governance structure, so they are trying to do the right thing by us as a country, by us as a shareholder, and... Uh, um, and us as a government, then I think that allows us, and I keep saying it, the best opportunity to maximise, you know, it, the, those two sectors. So I think where the government is trying to go to is to try and get, uh, um, you know, this cumul structures up. Uh, you know, I think uh, several weeks ago the government made the decision to put all its petroleum assets and, 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 and Octedi. Martin, as the chairman of Octedi, by the time this goes to air, I assure you that the Octedi website will be up and running. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you put all of these assets, when you put them under, under one roof, these are quite sizable. You put, uh, you know, the 10% the, the of oil search that we've just acquired, you put in uh, you know, National Petroleum Company, which is our PNG, LNG, uh, you know, uh, equity. If you put in Octedi, you know, that's nearly an $11 billion company. You know, that'd be sitting number 10, number 11 on the Australian Stock Exchange. This is big, big people stuff. And so for us to get you know, the good people to be able to manage these types of things, I think it allows us to increase the size of the envelope. And that, that's what we want. And then, again, government and civil society and then the industry can then work, work out the best way for, for all Papua New Guineans to realise these benefits. And it, it, it can touch them. The, you know, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and I know, again, there's a question coming up on that, but we've got to be clear on, on Sovereign Wealth Fund, you know, and, and, and I think, uh, you know, Sione there from, from, from the Department of Treasury is trying to explain. Sovereign wealth, comes come, sovereign wealth Funds come in all shapes and sizes, and they've got all different kinds of purposes. If you look at the Australian Future Fund, for example, that's an attempt to address the issue of an unfunded superannuation liability. If you look at what Octedi has with SDP, or had with SDP, for example, that's uh, put that money away and don't touch it until the mine closes. If you look at what they've got in Timor-Leste, again, put that money away until the mine closes. Uh, you know, for us, us is our build, our build our country fund, yeah? We're always thinking to ourselves, what's the point of having all this money if children are dying of malaria? What's the point of having all this money if children have to walk three days to get to a school? You know, all of these types of things are why we, ha we have to build our country. Um, and the Sovereign Wealth Fund, as I was saying, this is big, big bucks that, that we're going to be receiving. So the Sovereign Wealth Fund as a store of value allows us to invest in human capital, roads, schools, bridges and hospitals, we invest in women, we invest in our churches, we invest in our youths, so that in the future we have a class of Papua New Guinean that is healthier, we have a class of Papua New Guinean that is more educated, we have a class of Papua New Guinean that is exposed through infrastructure and through the technologies of mobile communication and, 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 and internet protocols. Um, and we also give them some cash. My worry was always if you give them cash, Who's to say that the Papua New Guinea in the future is going to spend it better than the Papua New Guinea in now? Yeah? <laughs> and therefore, by investing in, uh, in, in, in human capital, that allows the future Papua New Guinean 
to have the best go at, uh, at realizing the benefits of, um, of that. You know, I think transparency, if you take it away from you know, this, the idea of an EITI, transparency, honesty, you know, integrity, that's got to become a way of life. You know, you live by that and, and you've got to die by that. Uh, I know we've, you know, again, when we talk about how the people are viewing uh, some of the, you know, our development in the, in, 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 in the rural areas, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is for, is for Papua New Guineans to lose hope, yeah? Certainly when I was a young professional, when I started working in the early 2000s, and, and the, the PNG to Queensland gas pipeline had just fallen over, the biggest thing that we as young professionals had to look forward to, and many of you in the audience and the viewers will understand this, was a privatization program. That was going to change everything. And then again, God blessed us because he gave us this fantastic project called the PNG LNG project, which now, you know, young Papua New Guineans have this great opportunity to become accountants, to become lawyers, to become doctors, and then become technical people in this particular area. And so, um, you know, the, the, the idea of being transparent and giving our community and our constituencies as much information as possible, I hope they get hope from it, you know, that there is funds out there, that there are good people that are trying to do the right thing and therefore it's worth being a part of this country, whether you're in a private sector or whether you're in civil society or you're in government, you're trying to make uh, Papua New Guinea this great country that, that we all know it is and, and, and the greater country that it's going to become. The end of that, Alan, as we were saying, is this, you know, is this ICAC. You know, naming and shaming is great, but if you can't punish these people, then there's a problem. And I've said this at international forums as well. EITI, in my view, has to come along with the ability to prosecute those that do wrong. You know, EITI will tell us, well, this company has done the wrong thing, or this government official has done the wrong thing, this province has done the wrong thing, that landowner has done the wrong thing. Then we have to have a very, very strong mechanism, like an independent commission against corruption, and I think we've got an, an interim office against corruption right now. Uh, these are all you know, elements, very favorable elements for us to go after those that ch choose to do the wrong thing in this country. Thank you, Secretary. But Anyone there else? There is, just on the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund, of course, there is also the function of, yes, not just spending, but also putting some aside, not just f for the future, but also for the stabilization or sanitization purpose. Because obviously one wants to invest to facilitate, to help try and reduce the costs for other businesses other than the extractive industries to make them more potentially competitive, but also to, uh, to minimize the appreciation of currency down the track, which again, we've just had a little hike just recently, and I know that uh, there are arguments that have been presented as to why that happened, but at the same time it is hurting significant sectors of the uh, community business sector which actually generates jobs, agriculture and, and manufacturing and so on. So, and, and I think Paul makes a very important point. The, the issue around the resource curse and Dutch disease is it really hurts those that we are trying to protect and, and that is those in the rural areas, the small to medium uh, enterprises sector and you know, the agriculture sector which is where most of our people participate. But, but Paul's absolutely right. You know, the idea of the sovereign wealth fund is because it is a large, you know, pool or envelope of, of resources, if you try to use it all at once at the same time, uh, you know, it will overheat the economy and that's just the reality. Um, and so the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, and again our fund is a Build Papua New Guinea fund, but it's Build Papua New Guinea in the responsible way. The way that our Sovereign Wealth Fund is structured is it's, it's, it's centered around the budget. So at no stage, you know, again, my worry about the Sovereign Wealth Fund you know, under the initial constructs as of when I was outside of, 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 of Treasury was that, again, you have a group of you know, seven or eight people, the board of governors, and then, and then they get to decide what happens to the future of our country. But the great thing about where the Sovereign Wealth Fund is now, and, and I can say that you know, by the time this is aired for your viewers, Alan, we would have already gone to Cabinet, and on August 26th we will be looking at rolling out the, you know, the first reading and the second reading as it changes to the organic law, which is, the, which is our process. But ours is very much centred around the budget. So we have this money that some of it goes into a savings fund, as, as, as I was saying earlier, so that you know, in the future we, we, we have uh, a one kina to give to the next generation of Papua New Guineans. But there's also a stabilization fund, which as Paul says, is there to assist the country. But the danger is, and if we get the mechanism wrong, is that because we've been fasting for such a long time, we can try to build too much. Yeah, we can try and do it all at once. And we've got to admit, we've got implementation issues. Yeah, so for all of this money, you try to bring it in, all at the same time you have some problems. So uh, the, the money will always be available, and there's a mechanism to say that 
when petroleum or when mining, when, when there's high revenues, you can get this much money, which is a good much money, you know, good amount of money, and, and you can try and build the roads, schools, bridges and hospitals, invest in your women, invest in your children, invest in your youths. But also when those prices are low, and you know, as we are right now, and we're not earning so much money, again, we're not starving, we can get access to some of that money in the most responsible way, um, so that we are always building our country, we have access to the money. But as Paul is saying, you do it responsibly, so we all get to get one blah belt us all so that the economy doesn't get sick either. Alan, let me, let me just answer that from the perspective of, of the industry in your question. We, we, look at, we look at the EITI initiative, we look at uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund and the ICAC, Independent Commission Against Corruption Initiative, as our government's, our government's frame, integrity framework. And, and we look at this as the government's uh, intention to improve integrity, improve accountability, um, and then put in, as, as, as Secretary says, some, we, need, we need to p penalize people as well. But it's not just punitive. So when I sit uh, in my management team, uh, uh, and or present to our board uh, for, for Talisman, who I work for. We are competing for our shareholders' dollar to spend within our country. And a, a key question that from across the table, and this is important for, for civil society and, and yourself, uh, Martin, in, is th they, they, worry about, they, they worry about our governance. They worry about structures within, in, in the country to do that. So it's very, very important that we spend time and spend effort and, and professionally improve the governance structure, the integrity structures. And so the EITI needs to be done properly. Uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund needs to be structured properly. And, and ICAC needs to come. They'll give us confidence. So when foreign companies look at this, it gives them confidence in putting their investment in Papua New Guinea. So these are very, very important uh, for our country to drive that development. Um, so that's speaking on, on that side. I think also for the self-confidence and self-esteem, so changing my hat as, a, as an ordinary Papua New Guinean, the importance of us having confidence in government and confidence in this regulation builds our self-esteem and changes the culture where we have a culture of give me and the culture of opportunism uh, that pervades and perverts our society. Uh, so we, we need to understand this and, and work so that there's pride in earning our money the hard way, and it is hard work, not just by compensation or by threat, intimidation, uh, and oppor opportunistic stealing and, and intimidation. So, so we, we, we need to change this, and I think we're going to improve our society. Thank you, Richard. We move on to an audience question now. Um, Alfred Atia, if you could ask your question. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm from uh, PNG Smart Build. It's a new uh, consulting company in the building and construction industry, which is currently in the making as we speak. My question goes, uh, what are some of the key lessons from PNG's experience to date in managing revenues from resource projects? Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Anyone on the panel? We'll leave Secretary out for now. <laughs> Some of the mining ex executives? I'll let the other go. Uh, yeah. That one. Um, at the opening of this session, I think uh, Commissioner Palazzo mentioned something very important, that that was the, uh, uh, the reliance or the dependency we have on extractive in income. Uh, she mentioned a figure, I think, of 70%. Right about that? So, um, so you think about it in terms of, uh, I suppose, the, the, the current situation, and that is that 70% is generated by possibly four projects. Octeti, um, Porgera, yeah, Hidden Valley, and, uh, and Lihir. Um, so you can see the risk we place ourselves if, in terms of the, the kind of uh, source of income for the country, uh, given that level of, of contribution that it makes. So in terms of how we manage that uh, the, the, those revenues, it's very important uh, that we do get uh, those funds to the highest priorities in terms of the kind of services that this country needs. So the EITI, as I said, is a tool that can help us to do that. But I think the biggest challenge for us is the capacity generally within our uh, communities, but also within our co economy. Um, you know, Secretary uh, Valley described uh, the government's uh, um, policy to, uh, to, to basically decentralise the budget and have it flow directly to uh, provincial governments, districts and so on. 
and to activate development at that level. Uh, I think as, it's as the government's finding, um, that's a difficult exercise because of a, a lack of capacity at that level. Now the difficulty, I mean, the, the challenge it presents is um, you're tying up a lot of, uh, of that um, uh, development funding flowing through this mechanism uh, without that capacity in order for it to be translated into services and the kind of impact and outcome that you want. So th this is probably going to be the biggest challenge for us and, uh, and I think uh, perhaps within the, 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 um, the realms of government, within the circles of government, um, this discussion prob uh, probably needs to happen. And there's another side of that, and as I think the, 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 the bulk of our budget is tied up in recurrent expenditure as well. Uh, and so it, it does draw from the development budget that we have. And so that, that's another issue for us as well in terms of the kind of structural changes that we need to make within our, within our, uh, our uh, economy in order for us to realise a greater impact. The other thing in terms of the, uh, the contribution of the, of the mineral sector, um, think about the kind of contributions that have been made to uh, the Highlands Highway, for instance, the kind of contributions to aid posts and uh, schools and so on via the tax credit scheme of, of the different uh, companies that have operated over a number of years now, and you start to realise the kind of contributions that flow from the sector into this space. Two weeks ago we <clears throat> in the National Development Forum, many people made the comment along the lines of, wow, we've come in from the rural areas, you've got all these glass buildings and concrete and everything else in the national capital. We haven't got anything out there. Clearly, there is an increased flow with DSIP, etc., happening out, but because of this limited planning and management and accountability capacity, it's not sort of really translating. Although we are seeing the schools are filling up, but as people are saying, yep, the classrooms are full, but people can't read so we've got to <laughs> go through all the next steps to actually get the quality services in place as well again I think P Peter and, uh, and, and Paul have, have done most of the heavy lifting on this one but uh, I think for government you know the challenge for, 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 for Peter O'Neill as, 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 you know, as our honorable prime minister and, and his cabinet is, is to try and diversify our economy so that we're not you know relying on one particular area yeah um, you know, if you, you know, in, in cabinet and certainly in Vullapindi House and under our treasurer, Honourable Patrick Puwaj, you know, we are vigorously pursuing two things. And, and that is, you know, number one is, is growth, because economic growth is what feeds us, yeah? I mean, you know, all this mining and petroleum, yeah, these are non-renewable resources. You keep taking it out of the ground, it's going to finish at some stage. Whether it's three years, 30 years, 300 years, it's going to finish at some stage. So, you know, we try and maximise, you know, the opportunity that we get there, but we shift it across to the rest of our country. Yeah, the 80-20, yeah? so 20% in the cities, we get all the money and our, our challenge is to try and, and take it out into some of the areas. Um, the great thing is, I think we've been blessed with some of the partnerships that we've had. We've, we've had some you know, other partnerships that we don't want to talk about, but certainly we've got some partnerships in, you know, in, in Newcrest and, and in the likes of Talisman and, and ExxonMobil and, and, and so on, Oil Search. You know, they are in areas where government is not. And, and I guess so, in, 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 you know, and I said it earlier in terms of partnerships, in trying to get as much resourcing out there, and it's not only getting you know, money out there for, uh, you know, so we can promote economic activity, which again promotes growth, but you're also giving it to those that actually know their problems. You know, I've got to watch a budget of 15 billion kina. I sit in Waigani. You know, sometimes I don't know what's, what's happening on the ground in, 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 you know, in small communities all around the place. Um, and, and, and again, so we need to strengthen the relationships with, uh, with these, you know, whether it's churches or youth groups or, or companies that are out there. Um, we've got a fantastic organization called the National Economic and Fiscal Commission. Again, we've got to be able to, to resource them so that they can uh, you know, work together with these uh, districts and provinces so that the, you know, the messaging comes back to us that this is, you know, this is where we should be putting our money. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you give the problem of management to those that, you know, are actually living in the, in, in the environment. Well, we're, we're coming to the end of our show now, so uh, let me just put a, put a question to you and then you can all do your closing remarks. Um, we know we're getting a lot of money. I, th I think there's no doubt about that. Um, what do we have to change? I mean, we're talking about these transparency initiatives and integrity and all of these nice words. What do we need to change? Do we need to change our budgeting system? Do we need to change our arrangement in terms of relationships between, say, national government and provincial government or local level government? Uh, do we need to sort out the responsibilities as to who does what, whether it's the private sector, whether it's civil society? 
whether it's the different government levels, what do we need to do? I mean, obviously, we're collecting a lot of money, and we've had a lot of money in the last few years. We're going to have a lot more money. But what does it mean for one of our citizens, say, up in Maramuni or somewhere out on an island in Manus or uh, on Kiriwina or someplace like that? What does it mean for them? And I'll let you all close. Yeah, we'll start with you. Well, we have to realize, firstly, that <clears throat> we follow an economic model that's you know, practiced worldwide, where the expectation is that resource rent is collected up to the top of the pyramid and it will trickle down to people. Around the world, we see experiences where the trickle-down effect ain't working, and in PNG, the trickle-down effect ain't working either. So fundamentally speaking, the model of collection of resource rent and distribution in the country is flawed in that sense. And we can talk about improving governance, but how long will we continue talking about improving governance? How long will we continue talking about building capacity? The system is fundamentally flawed, has been flawed for decades now, hasn't delivered to our people, so we need to tip that pyramid over and try redistributing wealth in this country differently. Uh, Maya? And adding on to what Martin is saying, can I put a challenge out for our Papua New Guinean citizens? Can we you know, look to the type of leaders that we are electing? Let's put a challenge to ourselves, inform ourselves about the type of leaders we want in this nation. And in 2017, let's make the right choices. Because I think fundamentally it's about leadership in this country. But the, the power is with our citizens when they make those decisions. So I think that is a key as, I, as far as civil society is concerned. A key is getting the right leadership, whether it's political leadership, whether it's leadership within NGOs, whether it's leadership um, within a community. So as citizens, let's look to who we are electing as leaders in our, in our maybe, communities. Maybe to complement that, don't just be getting the right people. Ask for the right things. Know what government is actually there for and expect government to play its part. You, the community, you also make your contribution. You play your part. But don't go asking the politicians to do what they're not meant to be doing, which is dishing out the, your school fees, your he health, your moving your coffins around. Be moving your coffin to the village, yeah. Giving jobs True. to your son who you know has no capability of mm. taking on that top government job or whatever. Betty? Yeah, thank you. Um, Talking about revenue transparency and uh, um, the results that come out from what is collected as revenue, um, let me say that um, from an IRC point of perspective, point of view, we account for revenue as best as we can. Everything that comes in is receipted, recorded, and sent to Waigani. Um, so we do our part in terms of transparency and accountability accountability in revenue collection. Um, and coming back to the question that the little girl asked in the video, um, maybe it's time for us to stop and think about where we want to be in, in 20 years time. We have the fifth, uh, vision 2050, which if we are tracking well along with the vision 2050, and um, routing all our um, funds according to the priorities identified in the Vision 2050, then we can probably make a difference in the country. But I think we should be looking at making a difference now. And uh, the coming together of um, concepts or institutions like um, the ICAC, um, SWF, um, EITI. Sustainable Development Strategy. Yes, uh, all should be like um, working together to promote and encourage accountability, transparency from revenue right down to expenditure and goods and services. So that, say, in 10 years' time, that little girl there can be able to come out and say, oh, now I know where these revenues are going to. Now I can easily go to school with, mm. because there's a road there or there's a boat that can take me from the, my remote island to go and access a hospital in town. So mm. I think it's time for us to think really seriously about transparency, accountability, um, integrity in this country. To the private sector guys, I'll, I'll let the secretary close, but uh, 
I'll, I'll come to you, Richard. Yeah, look, uh, uh, um, let's not wait to 2017 with respect to, to the premise of your, uh, your, your statement. I think each of us as Papua New Guineans need to examine ourselves and our own behaviour and approach issues with a national or nation-building approach and, and less self-centred. Um, Martin, we, uh, I'm the company I work for, we're starting a project in the w Western province. And so we have a fantastic opportunity to do something right. And uh, what saddens me is that uh, just getting the right people in the room to collaborate, to pull something together, like a power generation plant, which is necessary, um, and, and get that working, and work with our, our landowners to, to build a, learn from the experiences of before, try to, and put a company or, or a structure of companies that, that can be more meaningful to our people. Um, and then at the same time, collaboration with government and, and with uh, due respect, Secretary, ha having our bureaucrats sit down, all of us sit in the room together with our landowners, provincial government, local level government, not being self-centered, but to work this. So the structures are there. I, 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 hear, I hear your point. The structures are there. I, I sit in meetings trying to, tr trying to endear this and, and there are these roadblocks. And now we, so, so it's not about foreign companies uh, with foreigners that don't un understand. It's foreign companies with Papua New Guineans that are trying, trying to find a different route forward to make this work. So it's our own behavior and our own behavior and, and, and we, we, we need that uh, commitment and, and that's just day-to-day -day behavior from our bureaucrats to help us get over. These, these are not complicated and, and we need to be careful not to overcomplicate rather simple things. Mm. Peter? Look, I think, um, importantly for me, I, I think it's um, improving our governance systems uh, within the country, ensuring that there is a deterrent um, which, in a sense, penalises uh, criminality or, or, or corruption. Um, underneath that, though, I think we need to strategically recruit uh, and reform some of our key government agencies and institutions, um, and then, in a sense, allow those institutions if we can, at all, at, at all possible cost, to work relatively free of political in interference so that they can be the engine rooms that, that, that bring about the change that we need. Oh, Secretary, what do we change? Thanks. Uh, let me, uh, and I'm careful because I'm a bureaucrat here, but... Um, look, look, and we're all looking at you. You know, you know my message to, to, to everyone, to, to all the viewers and to everyone in the room is that, you know, there is so much hope in this country, there really is. You know, more now than ever. Um, so what's going to change? Well, well, things are going to change. It's going to be a process, but things are going to change. When I speak publicly, I, make the, I always make the joke that, you know, my old man had my job twice. And he got excited when he was Secretary of Treasury that they had a 3 billion Kina budget. We now look after a 15 billion Kina budget. So all the things that I do now and that Vulapindi does now and the commissioner used to work with my late father and, and all the things that IRC are doing and the customs are doing and all the other government you know, agencies and and departments are doing, it has to change. It's not going to happen overnight, but we're on the path to. Because, you know, some countries, you know, don't get the, the blessings that we've had. You know, we, we had minerals boom earlier on, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And then we've got to say we didn't do the best with it. And God bless us by giving us a second one. You know, now people like me, we leave the private sector. And, and again, it's because this government and, and this cabinet led by Peter O'Neill is the most, you know, in my view, the most progressive government that we've ever had. This is our best opportunity to pursue growth, and this is our best opportunity to reform. You know, we're now able to, and certainly, you know, unfortunately only in the, in, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the urban areas, but hopefully that message gets out to the rural areas that there are some really good people with good intentions on all sides, in, in, in the civil society, your leadership at your village level or at your community level, at the, you know, the, at, at the, at the higher national civil society level. I know Maya and, and Martin and, and Paul do a lot of good work um, you know, in, in terms of the quality of, uh, of private sector partners that we're now able to engage with. You know, they're getting better as well. And, and again, when you talk about ExxonMobil, you know, on any given day, that could be the world's largest company. And they have rules that they have to, uh, to abide by. And, and so us as government, you know, we are chasing the ball. Like I said, we didn't choose to have all of these things. We were blessed with these things. And therefore, we have to put ourselves in a position to maximize not only for, for, for this year uh, and for this generation, but certainly for next generation. I mean, 
You know, part of the whole thing around, part of the whole uh, discourse around the EITA and the Sovereign Wealth Fund is that these things have been in the ground for thousands of years, yeah? God put them there. It's not for us to, uh, to use and, and, and to finish and squander and, and leave the, the next generation wondering, what, what, you know, what did those guys do? So I, I, I do, would like for everyone to, to, to feel and understand that there is hope. So get involved, as Maya said, whether it's through your electoral process or whether it's through, your, you know, through the work that you do. Um, you know, get involved and have hope for this country. And, and again, I think the, the social media allows us to, to interact on a, on a more active basis. And so I'm hoping that we understand. We can't see everything. So the more we see, and again, in, in, in our way, we will try and put as much resources as we can uh, so that we can pursue these things. Thank you, Secretary. You've been watching Tanim Ground. That's all we have time for, unfortunately. Our discussion for today was around revenue transparency, perspectives from government, civil society, and industry. Um, we now close, but please join me in thanking our wonderful panel. I have here Secretary Barry Vele from Treasury. Um, again, Richard Kussman, uh, Chamber of Mines and Petroleum, thank you. Maya Papal, thank you very much. <laughs> Martin Namorong. Uh, to my left, we have um, Paul Barker. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Betty Palasso from IRC. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, Peter Aitzi. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we have time for. My name is Alan Bird, and thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. And remember... Talk, talk, belong you. <laughs>